think that um, I can relate to your cynicism about corporations and basically just not expecting them to be the drivers of doing the right thing. And, and, and the, the Milton Friedman piece is very elegant, and, and he t but he talks about you know, how corporations should basically maximize profits within the constraints set by law and governments, and you kind of talk about, well, you know, it's really about governments imposing rules and, and on corporations, but the problem is that it's not one way. You know, you have huge corporate influence in policy, and just to pick on um, uh, one of your competitors, Ms. Bader, you know, ExxonMobil, you know, spending until recently vast sums of money trying to <coughs> combat the science on climate change and, tr you know, trying to, you know, influence policy. And so I think that's where kind of, in practice, this sort of an argument falls short. You can't rely on governments because there's so much corporate influence in state governments. And so, you know, whether you like it or not, it seems that there is, you know, if you want to achieve kind of the most social utility, you do somehow need that morality in corporations, so. Mine did like, mine was a little bit away from that, but going to your point about uh, you briefly mentioned the industry groups of which you're a part, Ms. Bader. And I'm just curious, when you, when you talk about wanting to initiate these principles, put values in place, how do you think of yourself as leading the industry? How do you think of yourself as wanting to impact those groups to come along to the same change? The reason I ask, this summer I worked in sustainability business development for Ford Motor Company. And I worked directly under the gentleman who wrote their human rights charter. And it, this is something that was a first of its kind in the industry and one that all of the other producers came around to across the developing world to ensure there was standards of, of production and, and labor rights and, and labor, tr labor treatment. How do you perceive that and, and what are you trying to do with the things you're implementing for your own company to impact the community of, of companies that you interact with and compete against? Ah, I don't get to hear the answer before I ask. Uh, well, I, I originally might, it was going to be a defense of what I think was, Tim was saying, if it's, or my understanding of the Milton Friedman, which is that because we care so much about the social issues, corporations are not a vehicle that can ever effectively address them. It's, it's not what they're set up for, and it, not only that, it also works against their, their missions, um, which have nothing to do with social, benefiting social uh, society. Um, and uh, in general, I have a pretty sober uh, notion of what the Human Rights Council can achieve um, or does. But it seems like, from my understanding of the, the laying out these pillars, uh, something that would be in line with the Freedman is just clarifying all the confusion around it, since you do get bogged down with possible lawsuits and with, and it certainly is not the intention to abuse and disrespect human rights of the corporations, I'm sure they would just as soon respect them, both morally and because it's better for your bottom line if you don't get employees leaving and if you don't get uh, a bad rep. And so that seems valuable in a way that doesn't expect corporations to know, you know, to have, hum to have this moral uh, mission, which they don't, um, but it would be clarifying, which seems like a Valuable. Can you want to respond to the? Yeah, let me let me say clearly. I just don't think it's realistic to uh, I mean, just the structure, and it's a longer argument. The structure, and I think Friedman did a brilliant job of making the argument. The structure of corporations, and where they're lodged, and what they have in terms of status, uh, doesn't make it meaningful to hold them responsible. I hold you responsible, and you're sitting there you're worrying about you know companies lobbying. You should have been in Florida, you know, getting out the vote for, you know, Obama, who took five hundred hour, uh, you know, well maybe he did, but you know, I was he took five hundred hour. I was in Ohio, <laughs> so you know, th so the, the the answer is not we have bad government and guys go and lobby for bad things. The, the answer is not to have some mythical hope that this legal fiction is going to all of a sudden have moral standing. The, the answer is to have good government and to have, you know, campaign finance laws and disclosure and all the things about that that mean you can't be, you know, 15 lobbyists from the state of Michigan going to lobby to flush our taxpayer money down a rat hole to make up for bad management for the last 25 years who fought cafe standards tooth and nail and would have not only made the environment better, 
what would have actually been more competitive businesses, you know, which the you know Hondas and the Toyotas of the world have demonstrated. So the answer is not to come up with this fairy tale that corporations all of a sudden have this 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 soul and that they you can hold them accountable. The answer is let's get good government or let's boycott Nike or let's all go. I went with with uh, John Corzine and Richard Holbrook to Darfur to take pictures and to come back and hold uh, and Corzine, you know, propose a genocide amendment. So uh, that you got to focus on where you actually can make a difference and where there is some framework for making a difference. Christine, because we'll have one, two, three. Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree. And what I am, what I am focused on is I don't want companies to hurt people um, anymore, and I want to figure out how to make them stop doing that. Um, and I, I don't, I agree. I don't think that companies need. Um, I don't think that companies have an inherent responsibility to engage on some of the world's biggest problems. If some of them want to do that, that's, I think that's great, and I think it makes sense for a lot of companies and a lot of industries. Um, I don't think they have a responsibility to do that. I think their responsibility is, is to do no harm. Um, so that's, uh, that's what we're focused on here. And part of the point of setting out these distinct pillars um, it is to define responsibilities define these responsibilities as distinct from each other. So to say, absolutely, governments have a duty to protect, and, and that's non-derogable, and they have to fulfill this duty. Um, but also, corporations have a responsibility to respect. So if they're operating in a conflict zone, um, if they're operating in a place where government has just collapsed or is in or post-conflict and, and can't possibly be expected to function the way it's intended, that doesn't mean that it's a law-free zone. So companies still have a responsibility to respect human rights um, regardless of what the state is doing. So that, that's the point of defining those pillars as distinct from one another because um, the problem with that draft that I had mentioned and a lot of the rhetoric that you hear is that governments have a primary duty for, for human rights and, and, and then that draft played on that to say, okay, well, companies have a kind of secondary responsibility which kind of makes it sound like, okay, governments are supposed to do everything and then companies can kind of take whatever's left over. And you can see the kind of strategic gaming that this could lead to, particularly, for example, in places like where I was in Indonesia or in Darfur where the government says, okay, cool, the more I step back, the more everyone will expect companies to move in and that is completely inappropriate, right? So the point is to define those responsibilities as, as obviously they're related but as distinct from one another. Um, the, the, uh, the point about working within um, industry groups is an interesting one, and I think it's, it's been quite different um, in terms of climate change and, and in terms of the environment. So, I mean, when, when, um, when Lord Brown you know, took this very big, bold stance of stepping out of the industry group and being the first head of a major ener energy company to you know, proclaim that climate change was an issue and we were gonna do something about it, he was not a, a popular guy at, at you know, the big industry dinners. Um, but that, I think, felt quite different to, um, to human rights. And so um, one of BP's seminal moments on human rights was in the late 90s, where BP, after the nationalization of lots of um, uh, countries' oil industries, and BP was kicked out of Libya and kicked out of Iran, um, it was really a US-UK company. And um, it going into Colombia in the 90s was kind of its first you know, re-entry into the rest of the world. And BP got into a lot of trouble, because if you take a guy who spent his whole career in Scotland and send them into Colombia and say, just build the same you know, piece of kit and you'll be fine. Um, we got into trouble for uh, allegedly supporting a violent paramilitary group to help protect our projects. And this was right around the same time when Ken Sarawiwa was assassinated in Nigeria. Um, and, and a lot of people say that Shell could have and should have done more. At that point, um, that's when companies sort of said, you know, together, like, there's no framework. What are we supposed to do? I don't know how we're supposed to interact with security forces and with host governments. Um, so at that point, the industry came together to come up with a framework, working with Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and the US and UK governments, came up with something called the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights. And this is a voluntary set of principles, but it's become the de facto industry standard for how companies interact with their security forces. So I think there's been a realization on human rights that this is a non-competitive issue that it behooves everybody to act together. And then in the Cadbury's case is another good example of saying actually we'll be more effective if we act together than if we act alone. Does that? Yeah. Great.